Amen. Thank you to those who have led us in worship. As we now turn our attention to the Word of God, please join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather in worship of you and to gather together with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We now pray that as we turn our ear to your word, that we would have the ears to hear you speaking to us through the pages of Scripture. We pray that this would not be merely yet another sermon, but that we would all see this as an opportunity to hear from you. May we have the ears to hear. May we have hearts ready to receive. May your spirit lead us to truth. May your word shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Jim Barksdale pastored several churches in his lifetime, including Calvary Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California, the First Baptist Church of Emory, Texas, and um, Valley View Baptist Church in Longview, Texas. Most recently, um, prior to his death, uh, Jim was a member of the First Baptist Church of Sulphur Springs. I always knew I could find him in his spot on Sunday morning unless he was preaching at some church in the area. And I mean, uh, I was going to find Jim Barksdale in his spot no matter what. To include one Sunday morning in the early days of COVID-19 quarantine when we had locked doors, <laughs> locked doors, Jim Barksdale must have snuck in with a staff member before the door was shut. There, nobody but staff members, a TV camera, and Jim Barksdale sitting in his seat. Um, Jim once shared with me um, a bit of his prayer life. And in that conversation, uh, he revealed to me a specific prayer, a, a specific conversation he often had with the Lord. He often prayed, Lord, allow me to preach at some small church once a month until you take me home. Jim was faithful to voicing that prayer, and God was faithful in answering that prayer. And Jim Barksdale was faithful to God and faithful to the Word of God. He died at age 91 on October 23rd, 2020. His lovely wife, Mildred, preceded him in death on January 11th, 2020. I share a little bit of that story because I went to the estate sale of the earthly belongings of Jim and Mildred Barksdale. Uh, you know, the pastor and book lover in me said, surely I can snag a book or two uh, from Jim Barksdale's library. Um, what I wasn't expecting is what I found in the corner of his garage. In a shelf, I, I found a collection of well-worn old binders. And I went over to, to find that in these binders were, were the collected sermons of Jim Barksdale. You can flip through them. They're highlighted, they're circled, they're annotated. Binders, shelves full of them from Jim Barksdale's sermons from the 1950s to the 1960s to the 1970s. I also found a few Bibles, personal Bibles of both Jim and Mildred, and they too, well-worn, highlighted, underlined, circled, and annotated. 
I took every binder home with me. Um, I took a few Bibles. They sit in my study as a reminder of our call to be students of God's Word and people of prayer. This is now our sixth week in our stained glass disciple series. It highlights lessons that modern-day disciples can learn from these original followers who accepted Jesus' invitation to come follow me, our our tour through these disciples. is our very own stained glass rose window, which contains images which depict the life and ministry of these first followers of Jesus. We're taking the disciples as they are presented to us in our window. And today we discuss Bartholomew, who's depicted in our window by three filleting knives. From your seat, obviously Jesus is easy to find. Bartholomew's images are in the petal of roughly 8 o'clock. It may be hard to tell what those are from your seat, but those are three filleting knives. What can we, as modern-day disciples, learn from the life and ministry of Bartholomew? Before we dig deep into a specific text, I do want to take a brief pit stop in Mark chapter 3. If you would join me in Mark 3, we'll eventually make our way to John chapter 1. But for a moment, Mark chapter 3, we'll read verses 16 through 19. If you're ready to hear the Word of God, can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. See, I love you guys. I really do. I hear all the page flippings because you knew I was supposed to be in John 1. So all of you were already in John 1. So when I threw the curveball that we were going to make a pit stop in Mark 3, I hear all of you flipping pages. I I honestly love that and may do that from now on, just throw you off (laughs) with the Scripture references. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 16. This is actually a passage we have read before. This is the Gospel of Mark's listing of the twelve disciples. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Barnges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Today we come to Bartholomew. When you read through the New Testament list of disciples, you see Bartholomew in each one. This is where it does get a bit technical. Um, Bartholomew is merely a name um, telling you who his father was. He's saying that that name, Bartholomew, is saying he's the son of Ptolemy. Uh, Many times you'll you'll read through uh, the New Testament and you'll see a person's name and then their bar, their father's name. Um, Here you have Bartholomew merely telling you who his father was, which means he must have gone by a personal name. Well, traditionally, we have identified Bartholomew with the Nathaniel that we see in John's gospel. Now, remind you, John's gospel does not give us a list of names, but he does give us the call story of Nathaniel. In the call story of Nathaniel, which obviously paints him as a member of the original 12. 
So we can identify the other 12. We, we can't identify Bartholomew. He's not given a personal name. We're just given in the list who his father was. But then we read John's gospel, and we see Nathaniel, who's a member of the 12. And it makes perfectly good sense. It's a good reason uh, to see Bartholomew as John's gospel's Nathaniel. And then just another layer, you read John's gospel and you see that Nathaniel has a kinship, a friendship with Philip. And when you read every New Testament list, Philip and Bartholomew are always side by side. So what can we learn from the life and ministry of Bartholomew, who we also know as Nathaniel. Here's where we come to our text for today. If you join me one more time in a passage of Scripture, John chapter 1, verse 43. If you're still with me, can I hear it? Amen. Amen. This is going to be another Sunday uh, where if I begin to tarry, uh, you will feel free to give me one of these signs to say, hurry it up. We've got plans after this service. First uh, John 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael. This is our Bartholomew. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Verse 48, How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. <clears throat> He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Um, what can we learn from the life and ministry of Bartholomew, who, who I'll refer to for the bulk of this message as Nathaniel, since he's referenced that way in John chapter 1. I have a few things for you. The first is this. Disciples are people of God's word. We, we just read the call story of Nathaniel, uh, which came by way of an invitation from Philip. Philip's represented in our window. We'll get to him in due time. But Nathaniel begins to follow Jesus through an invitation of Philip. And I want you to notice the way in which Philip references Jesus. He, he comes to Nathaniel and says in verse 45, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, we have to dig a, a, a little deeper here, but in that statement, imagine this, uh, Philip is coming to Nathaniel and says, we found the one. 
Well, who the, the one Moses wrote about, the one the prophets foretold. It stands to reason that Philip offers such a description because he knows that Nathaniel is familiar with the words of Moses and the words of the prophet. I would even take it a step further. Again, we are digging a little deeper. We are reading between the lines a bit. This isn't on the surface of the text, but I also think it, it seems reasonable that Philip offers such an invitation and describes Jesus in such a way because he and Nathaniel have discussed the coming Messiah. They have read the Scripture. They have had conversations about the hope Provided by a coming Messiah. And now Philip runs to him and says, we found him. We've read the books of the law. We've read the words of the prophet. They spoke of a coming Messiah and we found him. The call of every disciple is to be a student of God's Word. Yes, this is a trait of Nathaniel. He was a student of God's Word, but that's a call to every disciple. You get into the New Testament, and the, the believers in Berea, the Bereans, were complimented for their study of God's Word. This is Acts 17, 11. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and ex examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Can you imagine that? The Bereans hearing the preaching of the Apostle Paul saying that's a nice sermon, it's a nice message, but let us check to make sure it lines up with Scripture. Psalm 1 describes the blessed person as one who delights in the words of God and meditates upon them day and night. Philip runs to Nathaniel. We found the one who is the fulfillment of Scripture. And Nathaniel responds, He's from Nazareth? Nazareth? Can, can anything good come from there? And it's kind of like a person from Sulphur Springs saying, Mount Pleasant? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, on a humorous level, I, I do think this describes a, a bit of town rivalry between Nazareth and Nathaniel's hometown of Cana. But on, the, on a deeper level, this too shows Nathaniel to be a student of God's Word. He's read passages about the coming Messiah. He, he's read passages about the family line of the coming Messiah. And it doesn't say anything about Nazareth. By Philip's description, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, Nathaniel's unaware that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, described as the city of David in Luke 2, 11. 
So if you tracking the storyline here. Philip runs to Nathaniel. We found the one who is the fulfillment of Scripture. We, we found the Messiah. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And then Philip responds, come and see. Right, you, you've heard my word. You've heard what I've said about Jesus. Now come and see it for yourself. This come and see is discipleship language that we find in John's gospel. Now remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them the synoptic gospels because they tell many of the same stories in the same way. But John's a bit different. We're familiar with the come, follow me in the synoptic gospels. John gives us come and see. Philip uses it here. He's following the example that Jesus provided to him in John 1.39. Jesus told that original group, you want to know where I am, you want to know where I rest, you want to know where I abide, come and see. Philip is learning from Jesus and offering that same invitation to Nathaniel. Come and see. If you keep reading the Gospel of John, in John chapter 4, that's the same language the woman at the well uses. She has her life turned upside down in a good way, has her life turned right side up by Jesus at a well, and she runs back to her village and says, Come and see. this man that I met. The life of a disciple is centered around first-hand experience with the Savior. We are to be students of God's Word, and if done properly, the Scriptures will lead us into a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Jesus told the religious leaders of his day in John chapter 5, verse 39, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Nathaniel's learning that in John chapter 1. You see, to read the Bible... And not fall in love with Jesus is a tragedy. To read the Bible and fall in love with Jesus changes your life and your eternity. As modern day disciples, we are to be people of God's Word. Amen. You still with me? Also, just two for today, if you're watching your watch, just one more. Disciples are people of prayer. Oh, we, we've got to do work in this passage. I, I, I realize that, so, so, so stay with me here. Philip has offered Nathaniel the invitation. Come see the one who is the fulfillment of Scripture. Nathaniel, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip, come and see. And now the duo are coming to see Jesus. And as Jesus sees Nathaniel approaching, he says, now here is a true Israelite. And here's a man of integrity. Uh, there's, there's no deceit in this man. Nathaniel's the only person to receive such praise and designation from Jesus. This statement highlights the fact that Nathaniel was a true member of God's people. He was a true member of the family. If you keep reading John's gospel, there are people who claim to be a part of the family, yet 
they reject Jesus. Jesus said, this one's true. He, he studies God's word, and he sees that I'm the fulfillment of it. Remember, we read our Bible, and it should lead us to Jesus. And you hear more of this back and forth. Are you still with me? Can I hear an amen? Uh, Nathaniel's coming. He's coming to see this Jesus. And Jesus says, here comes a true Israelite, a real person of faith, a real person of God, a real member of God's family. And then Nathaniel hears that and says, how do you know me? To which Jesus then responds, well, I saw you. In John 1, 48, I, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Again, this is doing a little work here. This is not on the surface of the text, but um, in the ancient Near East, fig trees were often planted near the house. And the branches and, and the shade from the fig tree provided an extra room on the house. You could go outside the house and sit under the shade of the fig tree. Culturally, this became the place where one retreated to pray. Jesus is saying, I, I saw you when you were praying. This is a reference to Nathaniel's devotion to prayer. And as we read this passage, it's as if we are seeing Nathaniel's prayers answered. He had studied the Word of God and was filled with hope of a coming Messiah. And now he's seeing that Messiah with his very own eyes. Again, this back and forth continues. Jesus says, I saw you essentially while you were praying. And after that supernatural insight, Nathaniel makes the declaration. Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So we've seen a few declarations already in our study. Peter looked at Jesus and said, you were the Messiah, the son of the living God. Thomas looked at the nail-scarred hands and said, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. And here's Nathaniel saying, you are the king of Israel. Like Peter, he's acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah foretold by the Scriptures. Amen. And I love this exchange. Jesus says, you came to that realization because I told you that I saw you while you were praying. Jesus says, you haven't seen nothing yet. He says, you're, you're going to see greater things. And then he gives them a, a, a glimpse at what they're going to see using an allusion to an Old Testament story about Jacob's ladder. You, you ain't seen nothing yet. This call and this promise that the disciples will see greater things stemming 
from Nathaniel in prayer. We are called to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We are called to always pray and never give up. Luke 18. Prayer, intimate conversation between God and his people, which leads his people to the will of God. The study of God's word and prayer go together like early mornings and coffee. We'll fill in whatever works for you. William Barclay said, when the light of study is warmed by the fire of devotion, then indeed discoveries are made. That's what we see lived out in John chapter 1. As modern day disciples, we are called to be people of prayer. The stained glass window of First Baptist Sulphur Springs depicts Bartholomew, Nathaniel, with filleting knives. According to tradition, Bartholomew preached the gospel to King Polymeus of Armenia. We have some accounts uh, that the king was actually converted. He, he preaches the gospel to the king of Armenia, which angered the king's brother. He was angered at such boldness that he had Bartholomew martyred. His boldness led to his martyrdom. And this is where it gets real interesting. Tradition has him filleted alive and or beheaded and or crucified upside down. We have one tradition, one uh, medieval document that describes all three taking place. That he was filleted alive, crucified head down, and then beheaded. It's that first part of that story being filleted that have gripped artists' imaginations. And throughout art history... Bartholomew's depicted with the filleting knives. If you do a quick Google search, not here, give me a few minutes. If you do a quick Google search of Michelangelo's last judgment, he depicts Bartholomew with his own skin laid over his hand in one seamless hole. Despite gruesome stories of his death, we also have stories of Bartholomew traveling, preaching the gospel. We even have stories of him making him his way down to India where he translated or at least scribed the gospel of Matthew. As you sit in this sanctuary... May you gaze at the window. And may your gaze fall upon the three filleting knives depicting Bartholomew. And be reminded of your call to be a student of God's word and a person of prayer. If you'd pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word may we make good use of it. And we are thankful for the opportunity to approach your throne through prayer. May we use that tremendous gift that you have given us. 
May we be a church filled with people who study your word and seek you in prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we conclude.